is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Lyriel. Chapters one through five? Yes, five. In these chapters, we meet a new main character. This is years and years after the previous book. Liriel doesn't seem to fit in with the other people because she's real pale, has dark hair, and morbid thoughts. Me thinks, me knows why. Hmm. Just a theory. Hmm. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Huge thanks to Abby for commissioning this episode. Abby is here in the chat. Hi, Abby. Um, So yeah, I did not at all expect to start this book 14 years past the ending of the last one. That's a minute. Mm. I thought maybe five, three, even less. Um, And... I can't shake the feeling that Liriel is Zabriel's daughter. But we'll get to this, but something's weird. Something's weird. Um, Abby says, honestly, after all your comments about wanting to know what happens to Sabriel, I was a bit worried about how you'd take this. You know, it's such a totally, like, I almost feel like if it had been about Sabriel still, but it didn't give me the exact information I wanted, I would have been more annoyed than what this author did, which was go totally left and do something completely different and unrelated. Like, not unrelated, because obviously Sabriel is in this, like, she appears within these chapters, but this sidesteps so completely everything that I was, like, thinking I wanted to know that that seems so irrelevant now, you know, and so much time has passed that we have people who are, you know, forming whole new conflicts, whole new resistance groups. And now like what Sabriel is doing, because she is actually in power, she's the queen, right? Like there is, there is something about that that makes her feel so distant all of a sudden and all of her actions feel like they will have to be so public that I'm more interested in Lyriel. And it's funny that I say that her actions will have to be so public because the whole premise of this conversation that Lyriel gets in on is that it's not public. It's secret. It's supposed to be that she wasn't even here. We weren't supposed to like say anything to anybody, all of that. So you know, I, I have this sort of idea of what it would mean for her to be the queen. And obviously that idea, this conception that I have is not correct, but it's, it's still there. And uh, I'm, I just, I'm really interested as this continues to see exactly how much of the story Sabriel is directly involved in and how much of the time she's like this, where she's sort of like in the background, clearly influencing things, having a say, still powerful still with lots of ability but not exactly in the thick of what we are reading about um so i guess we'll see but at the moment poor lyriel am i right so chapter one is titled an ill-favored birthday and lyriel is having a dream that she is have somebody is stroking her head and she's enjoying this dream and then all of a sudden she feels like the touch that had been cool and comforting a second before gets really scratchy and hot. And she wakes up and realizes that she's been like laying face down 
on her bed that's made of wool and like that was really scratchy. Have you guys ever had that? I, I had a re... Oh, Abby's saying, did you read the prologue? Yes, I did, girl. Thank you. I totally read it, but I didn't even start to talk about it. All right. Let me just finish this one thought here before I forget. But have you guys had this happen where you like... I have woken up with my face in my pillow from a dream that I was drowning. I've had that happen twice where I I dreamed that I was underwater and could not get to the surface that I couldn't breathe. And I woke up and my face was like in my pillow. And that was why I couldn't breathe. It's really your brain really does some amazing stuff in your dreams to compensate for what's physically happening to you. It's like how you think that you had a dream and alarm was about to go off. And then my alarm really went off when really your alarm probably was already going off and your dream incorporated it to make it make sense before you really were conscious that it was happening already. Um, but anyway, I just find dreams to be fascinating. And all right. So let me go back to the prologue though, because you write, and this is alarming. Okay. I don't care for it. So we're near a place called the red Lake and it says a low hill, little more than two miles from the Eastern shore. A mound of close-packed dirt and stones, stark and strange amidst the wild grassland that surrounded it, and the green forest that climbed the nearby hills. The mound had no name. If one had ever appeared on a map of the old kingdom, the map was long gone. They had once been farms nearby, but never closer than a league. Even when people had lived there, they would neither look at the strange hill nor speak of it. The nearest town now was Edge, a precarious settlement that had never seen better days, but had not given up hope of them. Which, if that isn't a depressing fucking sentence, guys. Lord. The townsfolk of Edge knew it was wise to avoid the eastern shore of the Red Lake. Even the animals of the forest and the meadow shunned the area around the mound, as they instinctively stayed away from anyone who seemed to be going there. So... This is, I mean, it seems to be something related to Caragor. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the end of the last book, she burns Caragor's body up, right? Now, I don't know what's going on in this mound. Caragor... Did, did he have horcruxes? Like, did he split himself into multiple bodies or uh, objects? Or is there like a gate here that we don't know? But I don't know. Um, but whatever this is, everybody avoiding it, even animals avoiding it, really points to some sort of black magic to me. Um, she turned him into the black cat with Mogget's ring. Thank you, Abby. I totally forgot about that. Um so what is this then? What did she do with that cat? Did she imprison it? Is this like part of its, is it kept here? Like, obviously they're being drawn here and they talk about Caragor. They, they, this guy arrives and he's got fucking the bells of a necromancer. Guys, what, how, what? His right hand rested against a leather bandolier worn diagonally across his chest. Seven pouches hung from the bandolier, the smallest no larger than a pillbox, the largest as big as his clenched fist. Yo, how, though? Because, like, we see later, specifically, Lyriel is like, oh, yeah, she's got her uh, necromancer bells, and only she's allowed to carry them. And I'm like, oh, is she? interesting he's got some fucking black market bells baby um and he heads down to this hill even though he sees that there are some other people there already um there are two people that are immediately visible but then there's also this sort of weird effect happening in the air that signals that there is something else like other beings of some kind And he thinks about maybe just waiting, but he decides he has to go down and deal with these people. So 
He retained enough pride and will to resist running the last half mile to the mound. It took all his strength, but when his boots touched the bare earth at the lip of the hill, it was with deliberation and no sign of haste. One of the people there he knew and expected. The old man, the last of the line that had served the thing that lay under the mound, acting as a channel for the power that kept it hidden from the gaze of the witches who saw everything in their cave of ice. I highlighted that because I was like, the gaze of the witches who saw everything in their cave of ice. What the fuck? That sounds rad. What is that? Well, it's the Claire. What? Now, I'm not trying to say the Claire don't seem rad, but calling them the witches in their cave of ice makes them sound way more intense than it sort of turns out that they are in some ways. Um, it's just that, you know, they're an organization. They they are, when the way this is phrased, it just sounds like uh, the three witches from Macbeth, you know, cackling over a fucking cauldron. Um, but they're more like a school, you know, it's, it's a, it, it's an official sanctioned community. Um, the fact that the old man was the last without some sniveling apprentice at his side was reassuring. The time was coming when it need no longer hide beneath the earth. The other person was unknown, a woman or something that had once been a woman. She wore a mask of dull bronze and the heavy furs of the northern barbarians. Unnecessary and uncomfortable in this weather, unless her skin felt something other than the sun. She wore several rings of bone upon her silk-gloved fingers. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that bitch sounds like she looks crazy. And I kind of want to see her. Like, she's wearing giant furs, a bronze mask, which, like, there's a reason that people wear masks into battle and stuff, like different tribes and ancient peoples, because... Masks are scary. They just are. Don't try and lie to me and tell me they ain't because they is. And combine that with she's got silk gloves covering her hands and then rings over the gloves made of bone. That's a look. That is a choice. I want to see this outfit. So she sees him and she tries to act like she's sort of in control of the situation and it's like he lets her because he knows she's about to get set straight so he doesn't have to waste time arguing because she's gonna know in a second but she he comes down <laughs> abby is in the chat and says they are one therapist tried to do mask stuff with me and i was like nope yeah i don't think so what no, I had my father's friend when I was a kid. He had um, a woman that he was friends with from church that he would uh, pick her up to go to Bible study. And I would have to like wait while she got her stuff together. And her house was filled with plaster and porcelain masks that were painted in all these bright colors, with feathers and lace and all this stuff. And those of you who like lived through the eighties, you can probably picture the exact type of porcelain masks that I'm talking about, but they weren't like human sized. They were like doll sized, which for some reason made it even worse. Like, and she had so many of them. And I remember they were all over like the walls leading into the front, like anteroom, but then there were a few that were on the wall in the bathroom that just stared at you while you were on the toilet. And I just in particular hated those. Like I just, I had this paranoia that they were definitely, there was like either magic that was watching me or a camera inside them. And either way, something was watching me take a piss and I did not care for it. Um, but oh, masks. Nope. Don't think so. So, the woman calls him Hedge. And, you know, as much as he, like, is about to let her know that he's the one in charge and he isn't threatened by her, he is a little bit surprised that when she talks, there's some real power in the way that she speaks to him. And she tells him that she sees that he is a servant of Caragor and that he has the brand on his forehead. Um... And he says, I carry the brand of Caragor, but Caragor is gone, bound by the Abhorsen and imprisoned these last 14 years. You will serve me now, said the woman. Tell me how I may commune with the power that lies under this mound. 
it too will bend him itself to my will. Hedge bowed, hiding his grin. Was this not reminiscent of how he had come to the mound himself in the days after Caragor's fall? So he tells her, basically, go down, move this stone, there's a tunnel, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> At the foot of the stone, you will see water seeping through. Taste of the water, and you will perceive the power of which you speak. Um, and we find out that the tunnel took five years for him personally to dig. Uh, and the seeping water was the first visible sign of a struggle for freedom that had gone on for more than 2000 years. So, okay. You're a servant of Caragor, she says. And he's like, I mean, I have his mark, but he's not the thing. There's something way older here. Uh, okay. Don't like that. Karakor is... I... Karakor, okay. I have told you all that Karakor seemed like a real messy bitch. Karakor is obviously like a huge drama queen, right? Like, just clearly. Whatever this is, is a whole other thing. And I don't like when there's just a, a sort of... Being feels like too specific a word. Force. It seems like there is just something akin to a force of nature going on here. And that worries me a lot. I am glad to hear that it sounds like Caragor is still bound. I'm not really sure how much to take that with a grain of salt, what kind of information he has and how reliable it even is. Nevertheless, um, but yeah, this implication is basically she thinks I'm going to work for her. I showed up here also thinking that I would be able to come down here and take control of this. Uh, uh, we both be wrong. And this thing is going to take us both into itself as servants in a way that is virtually impossible to resist. It's kind of the vibe I get. She has these two creatures that sort of rise up on either side of him. And she says that if she doesn't return, they'll rip him apart. And as soon as he hears her say that, he kind of relaxes because apparently he's totally sure she's going to come back. So he doesn't feel like this is a threat at all. Um, and he, I'm going to read this as well. Um, he could hear the constant whisper of the power below through all the layers of earth and stone, though his own thoughts and words could not penetrate the prison. Later, if it was necessary, he would go into the tunnel, drink of the water, and lay his mind open, sending his thoughts back along the finger-wide trickle that had broken through all seven thrice-spelled wards, through silver, gold, and lead, rowan, ash, and oak, and the seventh ward of bone. So she goes down there and he just waits for her. And when she comes back up, she just says, I will serve. And he can hear that something has changed in her voice. And he, it says, Hedge saw the muscles in her neck spasm as she spoke the words. That is right. Am I wrong that she is being forced to say these words? I feel like something is like using her as a puppet, like very literally like forcing the words out of her throat. Um, and he tells her there are charter stones that have been raised too close to the hill. You will destroy them. Um, and he says you were a necromancer, weren't you? And she's like, yeah, a while back. And he's like, all right, well, you're going to do that again. And he gives her his bandolier of bells. And it's like, um, here, it says, for himself, he had another set of the seven taken from a lesser necromancer in the chaos following Caragor's defeat. There would be some risk retrieving them, for they lay in that main part of the kingdom long since reclaimed by the king and his abhorsome queen. But he had no need of the bells for his immediate plans, and could not take them where he intended to go. So, 
lots of questions. Like he has this set, which apparently he is not supposed to have, according to what Lyriel says later. He has another set that he's afraid to retrieve. And I can't, I like assumed at first that those were the ones that Sabriel has, that he's going to try and steal them from her. And then I was like, I don't really know that. There's no reason to think that's what he's going to do. I just sort of assumed that. Um, and he says that the set was taken from a lesser necromancer uh, in the chaos following Karagor's defeat. So he like that was I assumed when he said that, that he met Sabriel. But then we see her later that she still has them. So I don't know if he took them off of her father because she he, she had or did he have them? When he was in death. No, because he took his off and gave them to her, bequeathed them. So that's how she even had them. So yeah, I don't know what this means. Um, she, this woman uh, with the bronze mask, she holds her hand out and there's this little p spark. Um, it says a splinter of metal that shone with its own bright white fire. Hedge held out his own hand, and the splinter leapt across, burying itself just under the skin without drawing blood. Hedge held it up to his face, feeling the power in the metal. Then he slowly closed his fingers and smiled. It was not for him, this sliver of arcane metal. It was a seed, a seed that could be planted in many soils. Hedge had a particular purpose for it, a most fertile bed where it could grow to its full fruit but it would most likely be many years before he could plant it where it would do most harm. Which, uh, I just don't like any of this. I don't like any of this. So then he calls her Clore of the Mask. He apparently has known who she is this whole time and has decided to show his hand at this point. Um, and he says that he is going south and across the wall. Um, the country of my birth, though in spirit, I am no child of its powerless soil. I have much to do there and even farther afield, but you will hear from me when I have need, or if I hear news that is not to my liking. He turned then and walked off without further word, for our master needs make no farewells to any of his servants. So, oh, and Abby is saying, or forced to have the sentiment, perhaps? It seems like something along those lines to me. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and, and so... I had thought, like I said, that he came here intending to, like, enslave whatever power it was that lay dormant here. And then he realized that wasn't happening. And he was just going to be a sort of a conduit for the power of whatever this is. But then it feels like when he says this, like a, a master need not bid farewell to his servants, then I feel like it turns out he is the one in charge after all. And I'm not really sure whether it's, it's simply meant to be like, he's the senior one in charge because he's been here for years before her. Or if it's that he is because he was the first one, he got the power and she didn't because he says something about how, like it just the, the way that she acts reminded him of himself. And there's a sort of like, humor to it like he's like oh she'll find out soon enough the way that i did but maybe he just means she'll find out soon enough that she's too late and that i have done it already and maybe that's it um but yeah okay so that is the end of the prologue it just feels like bad things are on the horizon i don't like this at all there's also i didn't really mention this but like in the background of this whole scene there's this old man who's just gibbering to himself basically um and it seems like he's out here, you know, making sure that this thing is safe. But there's there's a, a real surrealness to him being there, just mumbling to himself that really made me very uneasy. I just didn't like any of this. OK, so. Lyriel. Um, she is waking up on her 14th birthday. And the dream that she had had is the only memory that she has of her mother. She feels like, the, so the story is that she has been told, which I personally think is probably bullshit, but she trusts because she's 14. 
her mother gave birth to the child of a, an anonymous man, which is pretty much unheard of. The women of the Clare taking lovers is completely accepted. That's something that happens all the time. But the children that are born, they tend to most often be girls and they are always assigned a father. They always like know who the parent was. And for whatever reason, her mother doesn't tell anybody who the father is. And she takes off and dies when Lyriel is like, I think 10. She says like right before being turning 10, I think. Um, she had left when Lyriel was five without a word. Um, just the news of her death, a garbled message from the distant north that had arrived three days before Lyriel's 10th birthday. Right. So she leaves her when she's five. And Lyriel is just sitting there knowing that her mother abandoned her here for whatever reason from age five, which is pretty brutal to know. Um, and she doesn't actually hear what happened to cause her mother's death. It's just the kind of thing that like, I'm not sure how much curiosity she even has about it because there it's, it's an interesting thing that she doesn't seem to want to know about she it's like she misses her mother but she sort of feels like because she had her mother in person that her mother is a known quantity and she is much more interested in what happened with her father which is sort of funny because that i think is how our minds tend to work that we are more drawn to the thing that we know the least about and something that feels more familiar that we are at least very slightly acquainted with, we feel much more comfortable being like, okay, I know what that is. I'm putting that into this box, but this thing, I have no idea. So she really fixates, especially because I think the fact that having an unknown father is just so unusual I think that more than anything really gets Lyriel's attention. And she's just kind of like, why would she do that though? You know? Um, so she's laying here really, really bummed out because first of all, her mother died so close to her birthday when she was about to turn 10 that now her birthday has that terrible association for her. And she really has trouble like, celebrating it because it just feels like a bad omen, you know, which that's rough your own birthday to just be loaded down with all that baggage, you know, but then it turns out that she is the Claire's who I had said, um, they show up in the last book and I was like, what are these? I had no idea that there was like a whole organized community of them. It turns out that the Claire's are basically all psychic, that they all have the sight, and it takes time for it to appear, but it inevitably does. And it's sort of like getting your period because they, it's sort of referred, I don't feel like I have seen any of the Claire's referred to as being male. So either that doesn't happen at all, or it's super rare. Um, but she is a late bloomer. And she even thinks about how she doesn't even look like the other Claire's, which I feel means that she is not one. I think there's something else happening there. I have to admit, when I first started reading this, I had like forgotten about how there was like this, you know, 14 year time jump. And I thought that maybe she was Lyria, uh, she was Sabriel's sister or something, long lost sister. And because, you know, Sabriel's mother disappeared and died close to the wall herself. So I kind of thought it was something like that. But now I maintain that she's Sabriel's daughter. I don't know how, I don't know why Sabriel would install her here. It doesn't seem like she wouldn't, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyway, she is she has not got the sight yet. And at age 14, so far as she knows at this point, until she talks to some other people later, that is 
unusually late. And she is like super duper humiliated by the fact that she hasn't gotten it yet. Everybody around her is advancing. And there's like this whole ceremony where they wear a, uh, like a silver and moonstone circlet. Um, and basically celebrate the fact that the sight has come upon another woman, another girl. And, they get a change in uniform and she is over here still wearing the uniform of a child and at age 14, that is very embarrassing. I don't know. Um, like this is one of those things that I, I, un I understand the feeling even though this hasn't specifically happened to me, but I was a kid that grew really fast. I aged, I got my period when I was like nine years old and I was practically full grown by like seventh grade, sixth grade, like full on tits, ass, pretty much everything. And I would be around other kids that were not growing as fast as me. And even though I knew that we were the same or similar enough ages, in, in a lot of cases, I was even younger because I was, I started school a year earlier than most people do. Um, so I just wound up being the youngest in my class most of the time. I still felt like it looked to an outsider, like I was the oldest in the class and that I had somehow like been held back for some reason. It was just, I really had a lot, I was very self-conscious about my size and, and the bulk of me, even though, you know, I was really, I, I was not bulky. I just felt that way compared to literal children. It just made me really self-conscious and I felt gawky and like weird. And so I really sympathize with Lyriel in these scenes where she's thinking about standing next to all of the other kids, how she's wearing the same like uniform that they are wearing as children, that they're all looking at her, you know, like kind of slyly from the corner of their eye. And it's not even that they're looking at her and like making fun of her. They're looking at her because she represents something that they're afraid of, which is that they are also going to be her age someday and not have the sight yet and how embarrassing that is. That is the thing. Knowing that people are looking at you and like worrying that they could wind up in your shoes at some point is particularly galling. And uh, I just... I felt like this was described in a really excellent way. She just feels so completely alone. And even in this moment where like, you know, we have this uh, woman who shows up, who's like kind of trying to be nice and be like, Hey, I see that you, uh, the uniform that you're wearing. Cause she has like this blue wool sort of like shirt shift kind of thing. This woman tries to be like, well, it's your birthday. And I see that, that doesn't fit you super well anymore. So here I made, I made a new one for you that will fit you better. But Lyriel, all she hears is basically, I am sure you will never get the sight and need to change into another uniform. So I am preparing this other one for you that I made, even though normally we don't have to do this because by the time there's, you know, the one has worn out, you have moved on to a new one. So this woman like, gives her a gift that she's trying to be nice, but it's just a huge slap in the face. And it's really heartbreaking. Um, Abby says, I was the opposite. I didn't get my period until I was almost 16. And I still looked like a kid when everyone else was all boobs and bumps. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Abby. Yeah. Which of them is worse being like wildly self-conscious because you have everything first and you feel like you just don't fit in anymore or not having it at all when everybody else has it. Um, yeah. Ugh. Growing sucks. Like, let's just be honest. Getting, going through puberty is just a fucking drag for all involved. Um, so Lyriel is determined to avoid going to the regular eating area and dining room because she just doesn't want to be around everybody. Like she has grown very antisocial feeling that she sticks out like a sore thumb and everybody knows that she doesn't fit in 
and she feels like she can hear them. And this is one of those things where it's like, I don't know if this is true or if she's an unreliable narrator or if there are people who just like, you know, she finds out later that there are plenty of other Claire's who didn't get their uh, sight until they were 16 years old. So she's not that uh, unusual, but she doesn't know that at the time. And she says that she hears like the women talking about what to do with her. And it, is she is that what she's hearing or is she just like overhearing snippets of a totally other conversation and that's how she's taking it because she has her own baggage around that or maybe she is hearing correctly and these women don't realize that it has taken other women up until age 16 maybe that's just not something they are personally aware of and so to them this is a sign that she's never going to get the site i don't know um but i did find it interesting so she goes down and she's eating in, I'm going to find the, um, the description of this, uh, do, 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 oh yeah. So she is going down to like the area where the traders and like, you know, vendors and whatnot come in. Um, and she's going to eat down there rather than in the main mess hall with all of her peers. Um, the lower refectory, that's what it's called. So she goes in there and she has gotten something to eat and she's looking around at all of these different people. And there is a dude who makes eye contact with her and she feels kind of uncomfortable because she's old enough that she could be looking for a lover and that could be how he interprets her presence here that, you know, most of the Claire's only come down here when they're trying to find a dude and he makes eye contact with her and comes and walks over. And when he sits down, he asks, is this your first time here? Um, and she says, what in the refectory? And he says, no, in the Claire's Glacier. This is my second visit. So if you need someone to show you around. And she realizes that she looks so wrong for this setting because all of the Claire women look very similar, have similar like brown and light brown hair and light eyes. And they tend to get brown from being out in the sun and stuff. She looks like she doesn't belong to such a degree that this guy has no idea she is from here and treats her like she's a tourist and it's just super embarrassing. And he tries to keep up this conversation and ask what her name is. And she can barely get it together to even say anything. She's like, her eyes are full of tears and she cannot reply. He says, I just wanted to say hello. And she just like nods, but doesn't look up. And finally, he's just like, I'm sorry. And he just walks away. And she hears like some of the people that he is with when he goes back start laughing, which I mean, if you if your friend told you that he went to hit on a girl and she just literally started crying until he walked away. I do feel like I would have to laugh at that friend and just be like, wow, dude, you really must have fucked up. But I just this moment is so sad because he walks away and then she just mutters to herself it's my birthday and i'm just like lyriel stop uh i must not cry on my birthday so she is about to just like get up and leave when somebody makes an announcement um so ray i hope i'm saying that right um the voice was uh, the voice also announced when the watch had seen the girl who would be next to gain the sight. No one, no many. The nine day watch with great gladness announced that the gift of sight has awoken in our sister. And of course she thinks it's going to be her. She's like, I'm so much later than everybody. Today is my birthday. It makes perfect sense. And of course it's not her. Anacel. And Lyriel is just so horrified. Um, and 
somebody is like taking her plate and is telling her, you really need to get upstairs. Their uh, awakening ceremony is about to start. Um, and she goes upstairs and this is when she gets the tunic that fits her. And it's just such a sad moment of her being like really for a moment, a little touched that she's getting a gift from somebody who doesn't really do that until she realizes like what it is. Um, and it's aunt Kirith. And I have to assume that aunt Kirith isn't a real aunt. She seems to think she is, but because of the way that aunt Kirith is like talking about like, well, what would your mother say about that? Or she says at one point, she was the very opposite of mother about, you know, loving rules and this and that. But I feel like Aunt Kirith is has just taken on that role for her and is not actually related to her in any way. Um, but I don't know. Maybe she... I don't know. So... It, and there's this line that I really, really liked. Um, the pain of losing her mother was locked away in Lyriel's heart, but not so deep it could not be uncovered. Aunt Kirith was an expert at bringing it back. That is some real shit, guys. Like... I am somebody who, when I need to, I can shut my emotions way down. And I find that I need to frequently, especially as an adult. But there are some people that being around them gets to you in certain ways. They just phrase things a certain way or there's just an attitude, you know, like it's it's a really striking thing for me, um, especially when it when you see it happening with an adult who has returned to like a childhood area or people um, that they haven't been back to in a while and you see them sort of like reverting to behavior that you can tell they even thought was like gone forever and all of a sudden they're acting like they are fucking 15 again. It's just there are there is something about certain people that just triggers a thing in you and uh, I really feel bad for and this sort of spurns on what Lyriel decides to do here which is commit suicide she is basically so sure that she will never get the sight that she is a complete outcast that nobody wants to deal with her that's the other thing it's not just like oh I'm not going to get the sight that's so embarrassing it's also like I am not going to get the sight and I'm going to be a burden to all these people. And they don't know what they are like. They don't know what to do with a full grown woman who doesn't even serve the function she is meant to serve in this community. And she doesn't like being a problem that people have to figure out. So she decides that she is going to like climb up on the fucking side of this glacier and throw herself off. And I mean, that's insane. That's terrible. I hate it. But also, she's really in the depths of despair right now. And it's so sad. So she gets all of her stuff together. It's really funny because she's like gonna go kill herself, but she's gonna be warm while she fucking does it. Um, and she gets all of her like equipment and waits to put it on until she's like nearly outside because it's really warm in all of these tunnels. Like despite the fact that they're built inside a glacier, there are hot springs and magic that heat all of the hallways. So she is whining through and making sure to avoid people as much as she can. Most definitely not going to go to like the awakening ceremony. She's like, mm -mm, no, that is not for me. Um, and she puts on all of her stuff and she starts to hike along to the edge of the glacier that she was picturing throwing herself off of. Um, and when she it says, uh, let's see, do, 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 they had felt their extensions would last as long as they did and probably for at least three or four generations after them time enough to make the work worthwhile. Oh, that's right. Because all of the, uh, the different things that they have built around the glacier. Um, Lyriel thought of all those builders and wondered why the stair had been made with such uncomfortably high steps. 
but after a while, even mechanically counting steps couldn't keep her imagination under rein. She started to imagine how Anacel would be looking right at that instant. Perhaps she was standing at the children's end of the great hall, a single figure in white amidst a field of blue. She would be staring down the other end, no doubt, barely aware of the ranks and ranks of white-clad Claire, sitting in the pews that lined both sides of the hall for several hundred yards, twenty-one ranks deep. Pews made from ancient dark mahogany, with silk cushions that were replaced every fifty years with considerable ceremony. So, yeah, wow, that's a lot. It's a lot of... A lot of pomp and circumstance is what I'm saying. Um, and she's thinking about all of this and just feeling super alone and is really determined at this point to kill herself. And then things start to happen that make her sort of change her mind. Um, she, it says, she hesitated before the door that led from the stair to the paper wing hanger and the star mount gate. It probably wasn't too late to go back to say she'd eaten something that disagreed with her. So she had to stay in her room. If she'd hurried, she, if she hurried, she'd almost certainly be back before everyone returned from the awakening, but nothing would have changed. There was nothing to look forward to down there. So she might as well go and look at the cliffs. She could make her final decision there. So this is the first indicator that she is starting to rethink whether or not she even wants to do this. It's like she hasn't let herself really consider that she's changing her mind, but she's starting to be like, well, let me decide. Um, and she gets to the edge and is like out in this really intense cold and looking at all of the paper wings. And they are a little bit creepy to her because she knows that like they're technically alive, but they don't appear to be alive unless somebody touches them. And that kind of like freaks her out a little bit, which I think is very understandable. Um, and it says, Ahead of Lyriel, a broad, unnaturally flat terrace was carved into the mountainside. It was about a hundred yards long and fifty yards wide, and snow and chunks of ice were piled up all around it in deep drifts. But the terrace itself had only a light dusting of snow. Lyriel knew it was kept like that by charter sendings. Um, there were none to be seen now, but the charter magic that would send them into action lurked beneath the paving stone of the terrace. And all of this is describing, like, the areas in which they take off in their paper wings. She's wondering, like, exactly how they lift off. Do they need time to ascend into the air? Do they just go straight upwards? Um, and it says, for now, she forced herself to move and take a few steps across the terrace to at least look at the drop. But her legs seemed to have a life of their own, walking her along the length of the terrace instead without getting any closer to the cliffside. So a couple things here, like, first of all, obviously, it seems like she no longer wants to kill herself. And she is just, her brain has not quite caught up with the fact that her gut is definitely like, mm -mm, no, we're not doing that. But also, the fact that she's heading straight for where Sabriel winds up showing up makes me wonder if there isn't a little bit I don't want to say compulsion because that makes it sound like somebody is making her do this. I'm, I want to say something like, um, instinct, like a, a sort of sixth sense that leads her over there because that is where her mother is going to be. Or if that's where, you know, shit starts to pop off with her finding out that the others were 16 by the time they got their magic and that leads to her getting assigned her spot in the library. Like, I'm just wondering if part of what's happening here is her going with her instincts on things and that leading to better things for her. But I might be reading into that way too much. Um, so she sees a paper wing above and rather than just, you know, run back inside or something, she decides that she's going to watch it land because she's always been really curious. So she hides under the snow and uses some magic to brush away her footprint so that people can't see that she, you know, just dove under a snowbank. And she watches two people land and get out. And she is 
not aware until she sees the bandolier that one of these is the abhorsen. So that probably means the other is the king. And she's just really like, holy shit, this is a big deal. Um, and I really love that, like, the two of them get their weapons and everything out. They have this very short conversation. And then they go through the, you know, pain in the butt system of taking off all of their weapons and replacing them in the paper wing before they get in. And she's sort of thinking to herself, like, that was a lot of trouble that they went through getting everything out just for this, like, two minute conversation. And then she sort of realizes, oh, they probably have been jumped and lived in, like, such uncertainty and danger for all their lives so many times that they know way better than even for a momentary conversation to be without any weapons at all. And that is a pretty intense realization that, that what looks to you like an unnecessary silly impulse is actually something that they have learned because it has saved their lives. You know, I really like that moment of her, realizing that her coming to that understanding. Um, so she's sitting there and the Rangers come out to talk to them. Um, a small gathering of the Claire was issuing out of the gate and hurrying across the terrace. They'd obviously come straight from the awakening because most of them had simply thrown cloaks or coats over their white robes and ne nearly all of them still wore their circlets. Lyriel recognized the two in front, the twins, Sanar and Riel, the flawless embodiment of the perfect Claire. Their sight was so strong, they were nearly always in the nine-day watch, so Lyriel hardly ever crossed paths with them. They were both tall and extremely beautiful, their long blonde hair shining even more brightly than their silver circlets in the sun. Are these twins the ones that were at the end of the last book? Because I feel that's, don't they come across these two? Okay, yeah. Abby is saying yes. Okay, cool. Um, and five other people come up behind them. And they are, they get into a conversation with Sabriel and the king. Uh, and I should mention that there's, he's still being called Touchstone, even though you know, we find out exactly who he is. And even though Touchstone was like a made up name, he's still going by that uh, King Touchstone. And there asks, she, she comes down and she says that there is trouble in the West and we can't linger only long enough to take counsel. If you have any to give. Um, and the King says, I have raised six charter stones around edge and the red lake in the last 10 years, six, only two remain from year to year, and I can no longer spare the time to keep repairing the others. We go there now to quell whatever the current trouble is and to attempt to find the source, but I am not confident that we will, particularly if it is strong enough to hide from the Claire's sight. So, that's intense. Like, there's only two that remain, so that means that people are being murdered over these stones over and over again. Like, that's fucking rough. And now they just are basically like, all right, whatever's doing this, we got to fucking deal with it. I can't. Like, I can't just keep doing this. So we're going to go down there and we're going to put this motherfucker down and get on with our damn lives. And one of the Claire's says, it's not always strength that can blind our sight, nor even evil. There are subtle powers that divert our sight for reasons we can only guess, and there is always simply the fact that we see too many futures too briefly. Um, it, perhaps whatever blinds us near the Red Lake is no more than this. If it is, then it also breaks the charter stones with the blood of charter mages, said Touchstone, and it draws the dead and free magic to it more than anywhere else. So, later on, Lyriel, you know, we hear that she's really startled that their sights, the sights of the Claire have any sort of limit at all. She did not think that that was the case. And she's really taken aback by that. Um, and he says, there's always some new trouble and danger that can be dealt with by only the king or the abhorsen. Sabriel gets the worst of it, for there are still too many dead abroad and too many idiots who would open further doors to death. Um, 
And Real says, we rarely see anything near the lake, but we usually have no problem farther afield. In this case, I regret we have given you no warning for what has happened and no guide for what will. Uh, yeah. Sabriel is just like there. Um, sorry, I'm backing up. The one who is currently causing havoc near the edge, uh, a necromancer or free magic sorcerer who wears a bronze mask. It is reported she is a woman and has a company of both dead and living men and that they've been raiding farms and steadings from east from edge to the east, almost as far as Robles town. Um, so yeah, they're they're talking over the fact that somehow this is all getting past the Claire. They haven't seen any of this. And they're a little bit worried that if they go down there, it's going to result in an attack. And Riel says, I'm pretty sure if there was going to be an attack, you, we would see that and we have not. And Touchstone says, well, that's a relief. But Lirio can hear in his voice that he isn't even sure whether or not to believe them. Um, and she is not used to anybody doubting the Claire's and finding out that they have limitations and that there are people who sort of take what they say with a grain of salt is like really shocking to her. Like, I think she just finds it honestly a little bit insulting in a way, even though she is not one of them at this time, because to her, they are just so unquestioned all the time that being treated as if they're perhaps unreliable is just like unheard of, you know? Um, so Sabriel says, we'd best turn the paper wing around and take flight again. I want to visit the house on the way to Robelstown. Um, take to take counsel with asked Ryle, but the rest of her words were lost. And I'm really hoping that she was going to say Mogget. Um, still sleeps most of the year under Rana's and then that goes away. I'm hoping that that's about Caragor. I don't know. Um, suddenly the wind dropped and Lirio could hear clearly again. They're still at school in Ancestieri, Sabrio said. They'll be there for the holidays in three, no, four weeks. If all works out with this current emergency, we might just get to the wall in time to meet them. And we had planned a few weeks together in Belisere, but I expect some new trouble will arise that I will take at least, uh, and that will take at least one of us away until they have to go back. And sounds really, really sad when she say this, uh, when she says this, we have seen them crossing the wall though. Uh, and Elamir looks or will look very like you, Sabriel. And I want to know, Exactly how well does Sabriel know her daughters? Because she's talking like she sees them all the time. Like they're very involved in one another's lives. But I just can't help but think that Lyriel is Sabriel's daughter. And I don't see how that could be. And that Sabriel would leave her here or not ask about her or anything. Um, so anyway, they wind up getting... Uh, to the end of their conversation when there's like this kind of upsetting foretelling by an old woman, um, a far future in which your daughter Elamir was older than you are now reigning as queen. But I also saw many other possible futures side by side where there is nothing but smoke and ashes. And I'm like, mm, is, is Lyriel Elamir? Like, is that like, have they been switched out? It's like, what could be? There has to be an explanation. Anyway, they leave. And just before they leave, Sabriel's like, oh, yeah, by the way, there's something over there. And uh, you might want to look into that. And she does not realize, I don't think, that that is Lyriel watching them. And that she can see, like, the green from the goggles that she's wearing because of the snow blindness. And uh, they get into the paper wing and take off. And the... Rangers come over and uncover Lyriel in her hiding place and are just basically like, girl, what the fuck are you doing? And this is when she finds out that it took them until they were 16, a couple of them, to even get the site. But in the meantime, in order to distract themselves from the waiting and the disappointment, they found work 
that they could do to make themselves useful, even while they didn't have the site. And they ask her, is that something you would be interested in? Because we can make that happen. And she's like, yes, definitely. At least I wouldn't have to wear this kid's uniform anymore because I'd be wearing the uniform for whatever I was doing. And uh, they ask her what she wants to do. And they put forth a couple of ideas like, does she want to join the Rangers? But it doesn't seem like she's good enough at combat. Um, The charter stuff, like she's good at that, but that would lend her to getting in on the paper wings and that kind of scares her. And then she's like, what about the library? And surprisingly getting into like combat or riding flying machines, they're all willing to consider. But when she says the library, they're like, that's kind of dangerous. Are you sure about that? But what appeals to her is not only that being in the library means that she won't have to talk to people very often. And that's a big perk for her, but also She will be able to research spells and perhaps if she never does get the site, she can find a spell that she can use to commit suicide a lot more easily and it will be painless and then she'll be able to just kill herself and it won't be a problem, which is a pretty morbid idea. But considering I think that she's an abhorson somewhere in her, that makes sense. She's obsessed with death. You know, people have mentioned this to her already. So yeah, take that as you will. But... I really enjoyed this. This was fun. Um, A really interesting setup. So I have to wrap this up. Thank you very much to Abby for commissioning this. Um, I'm excited to be getting back into this world now that I know a little bit more about it and how it all works. Um, And there is another uh, episode coming up next Friday, a week from today. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um, Ooh, Abby just commented, I've commissioned up until the end of this book now. Wow. Oh, shit. Good. Yay. I love that. Thank you, Abby, for doing that. Um, oh, that always makes me happy because then I feel like I can just like read with abandon the moment that I finish the previous episode and I don't have to like worry about, well, what if they suddenly commission a voyeur episode and I'm not supposed to, you know, sometimes um, I've, I one time watched an episode of something that somebody had commissioned a voyeur of and I didn't realize that they had done that. They did it after like I even thought of it and I was like, oh fuck. But it wound up working out. Um but yeah, I I really like knowing that there's something coming and that, that I can prepare for it right away because I like to I you know, get as close to binging things as I can. Just consume it right one right after another. So Yay. Thank you, Abby. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, thank you all very much for listening. Hope you're enjoying this and I will see you again soon with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.